everybody, this is Steve Falcon Avery. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we're going to finish up our little discussion on the subject of mindset, skill set, tool set, heart set is the other one, and see how this actually applies to the kind of business that you know, each of us are operating. Um, I will say that if you go out there and do a little search, as I mentioned last time around, you'll find, find countless approaches, models, uh, whatever, that are built around this whole mindset, skill set, tool set thing. Some do include the fourth one for the heart set. Um, but this seems to be very common. Um, it does not seem to have any real formal structure around it. It's not like there's one main company that certifies a whole bunch of trainers around it, but it seems to be be a, under extensive use um, for consultants trying to diagnose what the problem is within a company um, and then trying to help them fix whatever it is that, that's going on. So very popular, but rather loosely structured. Now, uh, have any of you guys stumbled across anything more formal on these um, mindset, skill set, tool set, heart set things? Or, no, not I haven't really. seen it, T. No, it's just, I mean, this concept has been around forever and then some, but I've never seen anything formal uh, put together around it. And to me, therein lies um, where the, the opportunity is for all of us and the inherent problem in using this as the foundation for any kind of work you happen to be doing. So let's talk about that uh, for a little bit. Um, if you were going to a country, to a country, to a company, and they said, well, you know, our people's performance is not where we really want it to be. I got to believe that each one of you have your own set of questions that you would kind of begin by asking. So, so I'm saying to you, hey, I got a performance problem within my, uh, within my ranks. What kinds of questions do you want to ask me? David, you're unmuted, what, what so the burden falls on you. <laughs> what, what, kind of, what kind of output are you seeking? Yeah, what are we trying to get them to do? So what's this performance you're looking for? And how are you going about measuring that? So uh, whatever it is, if I'm saying I'm having a performance issue, it seems like I'd start by going like, what exactly um, are you trying to produce? What might be some other questions you would throw at them? Well, that definitely relates to the performance appraisal systems that the organization mm -hmm. may be using. Um, and so, you know, this is a pretty interesting discussion from that uh, HR hat perspective, because oftentimes what, what my experience has been is that the goal setting is lacking. And so, right. yeah, yeah you, you, you wind up with those assessments that people are either not meeting, like in the example you gave, they're not meeting uh, expectations, but mm -hmm. the expectations were not set. Right. And so I think this is a, another really important question when it comes to doing any kind of like performance coaching or performance consulting, or whatever. It's kind of like, okay, well, what is it you're trying to get them to do? And what are the key elements in setting themselves up for being successful in doing that? kind of work. And so part of it is that I have to have, you know, even if you guys think back to the programs we've done about accountability, we say that accountability is more of a formula and it has to have all elements present. So accountability has to have, starts off with a clear, a set of clearly defined performance standards. So to Tim's point, I'd be going like there, well, have you really set these standards? Have you communicated these standards? So do people know what's expected of them? Mm -hmm. um, so now what do they need? If I know what's expected what, of me, what's next? What, what if any training have you done? Right, and so training, so have I equipped them? Do they know what they need to know in order to do that? So uh, when it comes to training, training can be about knowledge. It can also be about skill. So do they know what to do, how to do it? Can they do it well? So has there been any sort of like demonstration of, of competence around um, the, the skills that are uh, being talked about? What else do they need? Well, they also need to be able to define what those mission critical tasks may be. Um, and, you know, we'd like to think that someone had already done that, but. <laughs> and unfortunately, yeah, they don't. And they don't. So employee A winds up doing what they think are the priorities and then only to find uh -huh. out, you know, in some uh, feedback session that they aren't 
you know, spending their time on the right task. Right. And then we end up holding that employee accountable for that failure to perform when, in fact, the, the burden should have been on someone far earlier in the um, in the equation. You know, I mean, yes. who, who decide what need to be done, how how'd they come to that decision, et cetera. I've got um, a story on that, T, real quickly, uh, where I was coaching an employee who had just received a uh, satisfactory review. And they were disappointed because they felt that their contributions were above satisfactory. And so I asked her to get back with her uh, supervisor and ask and just let them know. So listen, here's my goal for the next review cycle. I really want to be above satisfactory. What does that look like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she came back to me very sadly to say that the supervisor told her she, she wasn't sure she couldn't quite tell her. Huh? Well... <laughs> <laughs> but strangely enough, 12 months after it, when it's review time, all of a sudden, there's the ability to rate someone's performance when you could not help them understand what the goals are. Yep, 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 yep. So, um, well, go we, ahead. Haven't, we haven't gotten into obstacles yet. Uh, no, because the only thing I wanted to talk about last one was this little tool set thing at the bottom. There uh -huh. are raw materials. There are resources. So I could give someone all the responsibility and clearly communicate whatever their performance standards are. And I could give them all the training and all the skill development and all that. But then if I turn around and I don't give them the raw materials or I don't give them the whatever the resource happens to be. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, do you, what do I expect them to do? <laughs> so conjure it out of nothing but willpower. <laughs> so, so I think that these are the elements. Now we haven't talked about heart set because I think that gets into a whole different discussion about the company and how the company operates. But, but we, I would certainly say that. Um, that these are how we're going to be setting the person up from that. Now, we haven't talked about mindset. And obviously, to David's, uh, we're, I hope David's heading with all this is like, there's all kinds of missing things. Those missing things each represent an obstacle. And it could be a whole bunch of things in a particular category. But uh, let's say I've got the perfect skill set and I got the perfect tool set, but the mindset is not correct. So whatever these beliefs, thoughts, perceptions, attitude, I have no idea what the difference is between some of these things. Aren't beliefs and perceptions and attitudes all thoughts? Is there some sort of a thought that's totally independent of belief? And some, somebody just wanted to fill up the bubble. I think they did. They needed four to make it look right. So yeah. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> stuff's going on in your mind. Um, but I think there's some things that are missing in mindset as well. Maybe it starts to touch a little bit on attitude, but, you know, we're very much about engagement when it comes to the change grid. Well, engagement is um, uh, the result of mindset. So do I really feel like doing it? Do I, do I find it interesting? Do I whatever? Maybe that's thoughts. Maybe that's whatever. But am I motivated? Maybe that's about a little bit about attitude but I got to get my mind in the right space. So, um, so I think, you know, going back to the original question, we walk in, we want to get an assessment of the current situation. And so the kind of questions we've already thrown out there and these little bubbles kind of give us a direction to kind of go, what do we have as far as each of the things are concerned? Then um, we get to the, uh, the, the green step and the green step would then be, well, I know you said that there is this performance standard, but let's re-examine that performance standard and see if it's still the right goal to be going after or does it be modified? Is there, are there other goals, whatever? So what kinds of things might you ask your client or do with your client around the area of uh, that desired situation? You guys do, I mean, do well, you just... are, are your Are your people showing up for their shifts? Are they on time? Do they... Do they seem to be attentive when they're working? Uh -huh. um, you know, things like that. Right. And so we would just flip the, the, the language a little bit and say, how much more involved do you want them to be? 
Um, because certainly if I'm in the white step, the inventory questions are all there. Now, are they okay with all that? Or do we want to set a new standard? So what are these new standards? What are these? And so, so just assume for a second that we've done that green step. And I don't want to kind of just toss that aside flippantly because I know that's usually where things begin to fall terribly apart because <laughs> so, yeah. nobody does that piece. But um, you got to um, identify the ideal. You have to, and the way it looks and the way it feels, not just the metrics that are um, associated with the, whatever the performance standard itself happens to be, but what everything else that goes along with it. Because um, again, it's the desired situation. I'd like the work done. I'd like it to be done well. I'd like it to be done on time. I'd like to be done efficiently. And I'd like people to have a good time while they're doing it. So. <laughs> You know, you know, so whatever those things are, we want to make sure that those are fleshed out. And well, then we get to the real work. And this is what David was talking about, obstacles. So David, uh, to tell us your thoughts about the obstacle question. Well, if they've identified their ideal and they have a compelling vision, then, you know, we want to engage them. And, and it takes a little bit sometimes of frustration or vision to engage so that's that's where we get into the obstacles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I and, think yeah. in addition to that, I think these three circles could in fact also be where we find obstacles. Bingo! <laughs> that's why I put it up on the screen. <laughs> <Just say. laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Keep, you keep going, and then I'll I'll throw my. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we we talk, you know, um, about uh, the lack of skill set you know it could very well be that someone uh lacks uh, a particular skill to do the task that they are charged to do uh, it could be that they have insufficient uh systems to support that or it could be that they lack uh sufficient training in those systems i've certainly mm -hmm. seen that uh to be able to function successfully and of course the mindset it could just be that there's a lack of will maybe the skill set is there the tools are there but maybe the person is just checked out, uh, they're, they're disengaged and they just, they're not happy. We certainly are seeing that with regard to uh, the effects of uh, COVID. Yep, absolutely. And so when I saw this, I went like, well, I could see how this could be a useful tool for helping people identify obstacles uh, that are preventing them from having peak performance. I don't know that I could build a whole remedy around this. I don't know this is enough structure because it is missing another one. Remember in pride-based leadership, we talk about four root causes of human struggle and failure. Anyone on the call remember? What are these four root causes of struggle and failure? They all begin with un. Yeah, unaware, unable, unwilling, and unsuitable. Un unaware, unable, unwilling, unsuitable. Well, when I go like unable, that's pretty easy. That's probably about skill set or tool set, depending on what angle of um, ability we're looking at. So unaware, maybe that's a bit about the mindset. If we talked a little bit about if we were adding the heart set element in it, maybe that would also be part of uh, the mindset kind of thing. Um, so unable, unwilling, uh, unwilling, oh, unwilling would be which one? Where would that fall? Skill set, tool set, mindset, heart set? Mindset. Mindset, maybe a little bit of heart set if we uh, added that little thing, but that doesn't right. help with Venn diagram. Um, and then uh, the last one is where's suitability? So where do we start to say maybe the reason why you're not achieving peak performance is because you do not have the right people. Uh, right. And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just not a match. I could put them through all the training under the under the sun. I know in pride based leadership, we say and we mean it, uh, but uh, we don't want it to be uh, viewed as too critical. But no amount of training will make up for a hiring mistake. So if this person is simply not suited for the task at hand, then there is no level of tools that I can hand them. There is no um, work I can do on the mindset that's going to transform that. Sometimes people are just not a good match and there could be lots and lots of reasons for all that. So Tim, you've got the HR background. How often do you encounter people who have struggled or failed at a job assignment? And the truth is they simply weren't suitable for it from the very beginning 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have seen that. And it's not a pretty picture when you have to deliver that message. Well, right, because you figure they've done everything they can do. I mean, they, they took the job with great hope, great uh, expectations, but suitability is a really big, big deal. Now, when we get onto the change grid, we're going to talk about suitability in a little different range. But I just wanted to throw this up to say, look, inside of the world of skill set, there's a lot more things going on than these four. Same thing for tool set, same thing for mindset. If you just wanted to stay with these three and use this as a, a visual aid to help someone identify what their obstacle set might look like, that's really fine. But it is missing the whole idea about suitability. And we would have to blend heart set into this mindset kind of element for that to actually um, you know, play out. Now, I do think if people say, well, everyone we have, we know for certain is highly skilled because they have proven track records. Every one of them have got a proven track record uh, to do that. We go like, okay, then there's nothing wrong with a skill set. Um, and they go, well, and we've given them everything we can possibly give them. Well, then it might make sense for us to say, then let's put together an obstacle list specifically about this whole mindset or heart set kind of uh, contributor. Um, so I don't necessarily need to build an activity list on a change grid with things from all of these clusters. If the truth is we can um, achieve a certain level of comfort that a uh, one of these circles is well addressed already. So we don't need to go digging in there. Um, now, if you guys wanted to, you could put together uh, pre-mapped activity lists for each of these three conditions. So what about missing tools? What about missing skills? What about missing correct mindset? What might that look like as term, in terms of an activity list for a change grid? Okay, um, so point made that I think that's how I would use this. Can you guys think of any other way you might use this concept or this chart diagram thing? I think you could even do this for a nonprofit. I mean, I don't, I don't see this as having any limitations. I would agree. I think you could do with kids. Yeah. So it really all depends because I think that what really to me kind of uh, makes this scream for a change grid is when I see that each one of these ends with to do the job the job, the job. What does that make you wonder? It's like, what exactly is the job? And so because the change rate is activity specific, task specific, job specific, you wanna be, you can do that. So if I'm a parent and the task is, um, I want the kid to, I don't know, clean the room. Well, is it skills? Is it tools? Is it mindset? What's going on? What do I need to do? So I, uh, to David's it's mindset, point, D. It's got to be mindset. <laughs> Come on. You know, how tough is it? Uh, at the same time, if you want them to uh, create a short list of universities that uh, you want them to apply to, so they're getting, you know, they're at the start of their senior year, it's time to really start looking for well, where, what they're going to do post-grad. Uh, well, now you go like, well, maybe there are some tools that we need to help the kid get. Maybe there are some unique research skills that might be involved. So that's a different job, different task, but I could certainly use it. Uh, the same um, concept, but I don't think that all by itself, I would find this particularly useful. I, you know, T, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking if I modified this, I would probably draw a circle around all three of these circles. And what would that incorporate? What would that um, and, represent? Well, that that circle would represent the corporation or the organization. Oh, because, interesting. Because this is pertaining to the individual, but as we talk about it, particularly um, as David was leading us towards looking at obstacles, uh, what's missing for me is the accountability of the organization. Okay, yeah. Now talk a little bit more about that because now some of the things that I've seen before is putting the individual inside of the organization, but they say the organizational circle would represent culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could represent culture, it could represent um, systems, processes, uh, resources, all of those things that position the individual to be successful because mm -hmm. these three circles are really pointing the finger at the individual and there's nothing that's pointing the finger at the organization. 
And so could I create the, a similar set of three circles examining the organization? I think um, you could. And so, yeah, because ultimately you go, well, what is that big circle then representing? Is that where this whole heart set thing comes into play? Um, uh, I think it, it's I think it's the the mission and the values of the right. organization. And that to me feels very much about the essence, the if you want to call it culture, that's fine. If you want to call it, uh, you know, it's the it's the essence of the company. What is its attitudes, uh, beliefs, behavior, what are its value system, what are its mission, vision, purpose, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. So if that's not right. How many times might we have people with very good mindsets, very good skill sets, very good tool sets who could achieve peak performance, but not in that culture, not in that overall environment? Right. And when we talked uh, around uh, unsuitable, you know, it could be that you have an individual in the organization that's doing well on all three of these mindset, skill set and tool set. Mm -hmm. But you know, when we began to look at some things sort of contributing to the attitude of the person, maybe they are making a determination that, you know what, this organization is just not a good fit for me. Right, 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 right. So it has nothing to do with competency, but everything to do with the experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Linda and I are gardeners and we've always uh, seen this phrase used in um, personal growth and development about learning how to bloom where you're planted. Well, we can promise you, we, we have a friend in Michigan who's written several books on the subject of gardening. And one of the books that she wrote is called, You Never Know a Real, you never really know a plant until you kill it. And uh, so she's basically saying that there's a certain range of, uh, of conditions under which a plant will thrive. You don't discover what the conditions, what those conditions are until you really discover what those conditions aren't. And so when it comes to watering or light or temperature or soil conditions or whatever, you can't just bloom where you're planted because you've decided to change your mindset that I'm going to bloom where I'm planted and or that you're going to give me the this, you know, more fertilizer or whatever, you know, it, it, this isn't going to do it. I have to be sure first and foremost, I'm in the right environment. If I'm not in the right environment, might I grow? a little bit, but will I thrive or am I just going to be a feeble plant uh, growing in entirely the wrong uh, situation? Absolutely. So that's uh, my little metaphor there. In fact, I'll give you guys a, a real example. We have a courtyard in front of our house and um, this courtyard uh, is very difficult to find plants that will grow there because it has a northern exposure, which means in the summer months, the plants have to deal with excruciating heat. And from mid-October on for six months, it's not going to get a single moment of sunshine. So it's very difficult to find plants that can grow in the, such a you know drastic range. North side of the house is a very difficult place uh, to plant things. Um, so Linda decided, well, maybe if we put a tomato there, it's going to get plenty of sun and blah 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 so she planted a tomato there and this tomato is now as tall as my eyes uh, so it's it's way up there this plant has been growing for months now i'm going to say at least three months it's been there it's showing zero evidence of producing a tomato so what's the point of being a tomato plant if you're not going to produce a tomato <laughs> And so this, for whatever reason, this tomato is saying to us, I cannot become the, the, the greatest example of a tomato in this environment. So there's something, something is missing. Maybe it's more sun. I, I have no idea. But for whatever reason is, we have a tomato plant that is not giving us one single tomato. So let's now look at all of employees in an organization as being tomato plants. And this peak performance we're looking for is being their production of tomatoes. There's certain things that are going to be inherent in the fact that they're a tomato plant. So there are some skills, there are some tools, there is a little bit of mindset, but ultimately that environment has to be there. And so I think Tim's observation about all of this is encompassed uh, by a far grander circle that represents the organization or the environment or the household or the whatever. What, what's the bigger group that, uh, that this is trying to uh, operate inside of? 
You know, T, when I when I start an OD engagement, organizational development engagement, I, I like to deploy culture surveys and uh, change grids and, and other tools to, to gather data. And it's all around mindset, skill set, tool set. Mm-hmm. Um, although it doesn't doesn't come out that way, but unless you really analyze an organization to its roots, get get enough data so that, that you can you can make a a, a good recommendation, uh, you're underserving them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. And so, even though you didn't group them into these little clusters, you seem to have automatically created or gathered a set of tools to assess all of these. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so again, I do like that idea about ultimately, is there a match? That's where we have to bring in the culture circle. So, Tim, I think that's a great um, observation contribution there. Now, let's move things on to the change grid for just a second. And we can see what's going on now. We know that there is a relationship between one of these um, 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 uh, I'm sorry, one of these dimensions and skill set. So tell me how, what does skill set map to? Hmm. So if I said the greater my level. The change grid? Yeah, or just on these dimensions, we're looking at perceived challenge. You got perceived challenge, ability, size, and importance. Well, skill set and tool set would be ability. It's going to be ability. Um, maybe tool set might impact challenge a little bit because if I don't have quite enough of a resource, that's going to make it more challenging, but the ability might, you know, get, so some of them uh, could be impacting both, but absolutely skill set. In fact, how do we define ability? Ability is knowledge, skill, and experience. So the more I have of those three, that's great. Now we say ability can also include core physical resources. And someone once said, resources do not affect your ability. They affect possibility. I thought that was really good. So that as the amount of physical resources becomes compromised, Perceived challenge is definitely going, going, going to go up. And I, I, that's where my head started, they said. So, but let's say you have zero of the key resources that you need. Is this now affecting your ability to do something? Sure. Or it, it, they, they said, yeah, but it's not your responsibility anymore because what's really compromised is the possibility of something happening. And possibility should be on the organization's shoulders or on the universe's shoulders, depending on where you want to apply the whole thing. So, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a demonstration of this. So if I said, does money affect your ability to do something? Hmm. And go like, well, ability. Well, sure, sure it does. Well, let's play with that ability, knowledge, skill, experience. So whether I've got a lot of money or no money at all, my knowledge, my skill, my experience remains intact. So it's really the amount of money is going to affect perceived challenge. So if I give you, um, if I don't give you enough money, what's going to happen to your perceived level of challenge? It's going to go up. It's going to go up. But what if I give you no money whatsoever? Well, if that's a critical in, in component of the engagement, then my, my challenge is going to be through the roof. In fact, is it even now, is it even, should it rightfully even be my challenge? <laughs> and I think that's where we're talking about this whole idea about the difference between ability and possibility. Mm-hmm. So... And I guess I'm, I'm babbling about this because I can think of lots of gray areas around it. But um, let's say that right now you are a sales representative and you are in one of those industries that are deeply affected by the availability of microchips. So you are being assigned a quota and you are being held to that quota even though the organization has received zero shipments of sellable product for months and months and months. Should I really be holding you accountable? Well, no. No, because I'm sorry, this is not a reflection on me. (laughs) 
there is no possibility of me selling. And so I think that's where we kind of go. It's like, you know, if a resource is tight, then you can still judge me because I should still be able to produce a result, even if I don't have quite as much money or quite as much inventory or quite as much whatever. And again, if I've got too much time, too much money, too much of an, if there's a surplus, that's also going to affect my perceived level of challenge. And so that's, that's fine and dandy. Uh, judge me, expect a performance out of me because in a competitive environment or whatever, this is just part of the nature of the beast. But yeah. if there is none, Salespeople get that all the time, T, in particular with prospecting. Yes. You know, they're, they're, there's a demand for a certain level of prospecting. They may not give you lists. They may not give you resources to go find the prospects, but they still expect you to prospect. Right. And that's fine. And because they believe, you know, if nothing is being sold by any of our worthy competitors anywhere on the planet, then fine. We got a problem that's bigger than you. But if the truth is, there are still people out there buying things, and there are still people out there that are actively selling things, and there are blah, 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 then we need you to rise to the occasion. I can hear myself saying that to a sales team. So yeah, the job just became more challenging, but it didn't become impossible. Right. And so that's why I think like what I'm trying to do is make this distinction between a resource that is somehow um, limited versus a resource, mission critical resource that is absolutely positively unavailable. And to me, that changes the game. So if I'm holding you accountable for sales performance and the truth is we have an empty warehouse, <laughs> this is not your fault. <laughs> so yeah, you agree, David? Yeah. Yep. yep. So it's just the way that it is. Just, I can't sell what I don't have. Um, uh, okay. And by the way, we can only pre-sell so much in advance and then we become an excuse factory. All right. So I look at those and I go, well, all right, on the change grid, I can certainly tell you based on how someone plots that they perceive themselves as having an adequate level of skill or an adequate level of resources or an adequate level of knowledge or whatever, because that's being communicated to me on this perceived ability kind of a thing. Now, this idea about suitability, I wanted to throw something out into this discussion for just a second. And I know you guys have uh, been on discussions around this before, but in a hiring situation, which level of, of productive tension does the, um, I wanna say the uninformed organization have a tendency to hire? So do they have a tendency to hire stress, power, stress, power, power, apathy, or apathy? They don't power know any better. Power, apathy. Power, apathy, and maybe even? Apathy. Apathy. Why is that? Why do people who don't know any better have a tendency to favor candidates? They that... don't consider mindset as important as skill set and tool set. Ah, and yeah. so in an interview situation, or if I'm examining someone's resume, if I see evidence that they have a very high level of ability to do something and a proven track record around doing it, I'm going to favor that candidate. Right? Correct. Right. Yeah. And Tim, you agree with that. That's how HR tends yeah. to operate. Yeah. All right. What's wrong with that? We don't know the, what the, their future performance will be. Well, well uh, except we can know that the greatest indicator of future performance is what? Past performance. Past performance. And if they were already down in power apathy or apathy, or they're coming into our organization, they might be upgrade for you know a few weeks, a few months, because it's a new environment and uh, fine, 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 fine. But sooner or later, where do you think they're going to end up again? Power, apathy, or apathy. Power, apathy, or apathy. And so this is why I've always said well, the biggest mistake that companies make is they import uh, into their own organization a, another company's apathy and power apathy. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I, I can tell you, T, when I work with the people that I train on interviewing and hiring, um, I there's kind of an unwritten rule that people have to have a sense of, of um, performance or, or a, of achievement or of striving mm -hmm. um, 
that that is existent in in all their different areas that you explore in the interviewing process mm -hmm. and that if they don't uh if they're not if they don't have any upgrade tendencies mm. that's that's a red flag absolutely and what what uh david what i think you've actually just described is we need to hear evidence that people have some uh, appreciation for the value of challenge in their life and so this is why they're out there stretching and growing and achieving and whatever because they see themselves as having uh you know whatever ability they have they probably don't even really emphasize even, that even, much even if it's just being excellent at what you do and not looking for promotions or <clears throat> working your way up the corporate ladder you want to have that sense of of energy and pride yep yeah, i love my work that's you know <laughs> that at least says when you if i said to, to you well what is it that you love about your work yeah. you know what kinds of things might you might have you heard people say yeah i just for i just really love this I, you know this yeah, is yeah. you know what is it that what, i what frustrates you most uh well what frustrates me is uh no that's uh, just a question that i would ask oh i was gonna say yeah other people's negativity right right yeah it sucks me down so all right actually it doesn't i have to fight against it which seems to be a waste of time so but i think that's what we're looking for we want someone who's going to report a high level of ability thank you very much i want to make sure they're well educated i want to make sure they've got the skills you know they got a proven track record i want all that but i'd like there to still be uh some level of engagement in the subject matter engagement in the work and that's obviously much further upgrade and outgrid then power apathy and apathy could even begin to include. So that's what we're looking for, which gets us to this next little element, mindset. So where does this mindset live? Well, now I got to go back to say, well, there's a mindset at every single location on this change grid. I promise you, you name the coordinates, we can describe the mindset of yeah. the person who is there. <laughs> So that's not the question. Where does mindset live? What is this mindset you really want them to have? And where does that live on the change grid? So what is this mindset that people seem to want people to have? You remember you were circling the change grid in, in the past, showing where the driven driver, where problems are solved. Mm -hmm. um, I say in there. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, interestingly enough, these are the, the when I talk about where does emotional intelligence live, we talked about these four quadrants, right? Or sub quadrants, if you will, these yep. four sub quadrants. We said the driven driver might be a bit too aggressive. And while there's elements of the analytical driver involved in there, you know, we want them to be a little bit more. Um, I guess emotional intelligence involved a high degree of interpersonal interaction and face it a driven an analytical driver is not known for their charm and charisma <laughs> so we need a little bit more of that happening so th these are where we want them to be well are we then saying that the ideal mindset think of that as like a, a thing equals emotional intelligence are those are those what we're really are going for is the mindset we're looking for is a person with a high degree of emotional intelligence. Well, it depends on the position there. There are a lot of positions which don't require emotional intelligence. Okay. So and give, give. so, I mean, you, you really want to identify the ideal skills, experience, knowledge, behavior, background that you want in the position before knowing whether or not that's going to be important. All right. And so give me an example of a job where emotional intelligence is not uh, required for excellence in the job performance. Um, solo work. Uh, I used to be a precision form grinder mm -hmm. and it was just me and the machine and the tool. And uh, that was it. Yeah. And you could still be deeply engaged in what was going on um you know in a zen kind of state you know, creating yeah. these sorts of things because you're one with that with that instrument someone comes into the room while you're busy doing this and they ask you a question what might your response be well it's upgrade it's upgrade because now you've been pulled out of your mode um 
And uh, yeah, so so I get that. There's a lot of jobs out there that do not need to live in these four sub quadrants we've been talking about. Um, and so that's where we go back to this idea about, well, the exact job. Well, what is the right mindset then for someone who is doing precision um, craftsmanship sorts of activities? Great focus and attention to detail, mm -hmm. um, self uh, regulation, self management, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, still some sense of, uh, of urgency around getting the task done. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. But that, that's how I would describe it. Yeah, that's what I want the mindset. They know what they're doing. They know how to do it. They've got their way of going about doing things. They are one with the tools, all that good sort of a thing. Now, if I come along and say, well, you know, though they can be pretty brisk, br br you know, br brusque with people. So we need to put them through emotional intelligence training. Have I just wasted money? <laughs> yeah, you should, certainly did. Just keep those people separate. I mean, this, this is who they are. This is what we really need them to be. Now, Let's take that example a bit further. So let's say I was trying to hire someone who could do this precision work. And uh, in my interview, I find out that they report an extremely high level of ability to do the things we want them to do, technical though the, they may be. Um, and they're telling me, well, it's just, you know, it's just another day at the office. It's kind of very routine, very predictable, very boring. So, so I would say describe a, a, a challenging project that you were engaged in. And how did you, you know, tell me what you did? Yeah. Okay. And so what, what are you hoping to hear to give well, you an indication? It, it, you that know, I are... want them to have some engagement. And if they tell me about a project that was particularly difficult, that caused them to change something that they were doing or learn something new, mm -hmm. uh, and that they did that for that project, then I know they have the, um, the mindset uh, is there and, and, and at least is available to them. Yeah, and if they said to you, there's nothing challenging, it's right. all just another day, then that would tell me they're too far downgrade to import into my company. Yep. And then, so Tim, this goes back to the whole idea about suitability. When we are encountering people that are already plotting down in power apathy or even apathy, and usually we would say apathy is the really the big red flag, but come on, power apathy is your yellow flag. It's a big warning because <laughs> natural movement on the change grids down grids. So that's where they're heading. Do I really want to import them into the company? It simply may not be an appropriate match. But if I can find this highly skilled individual who can still say, well, um, I'm always trying to improve things. I'm always trying to do things, you know, better, faster. If there's a big project, then really the work is about getting everything organized so that um, I'm not looking for things when I'm trying to execute on the actual task. I don't want to be chasing down resources. And so it's better to do the, the you know, that's the kind of stuff you want to hear people say. Um, so you know, see, um, as I'm listening, I'm, I'm, you guys are causing me to uh, reflect, um, particularly in service organizations, more so than manufacturing organizations, where you have individuals serving in a role as an independent contributor um, and really having that mindset of not wanting to interact with others. Uh, I've spent more time in employer relations meetings over situations like that where uh, persons who they need to interact with, um, they're just not willing to do that. And there's this attitude of, you know, look, I don't want to be around folks. I don't want to just let me do my job. Mm -hmm. And and they're not understanding the need to interact with others. Yep. Um, and so that created problems. I'm thinking of Carol, Carol Dweck's book uh, that I posted in the chat last week when we were on the call, yes, yes. Uh, where she talks about mindset, a, fi a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those persons that were in those individual contributor roles, uh, in a lot of cases, exhibited that fixed mindset. Yeah. Um, and so I'm looking at the grid and I'm just thinking in terms of the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset and where might they plot. Yeah, downgrade yeah. versus upgrade. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so the question becomes, is it absolutely necessary for everyone with a fixed mindset to be turned into someone with more of an open mindset? Is I, that I, our... I, I have to say no. Yeah, is, is that really our know, role I mean, it, in It life? really depends on the job. It depends on the job. 
it depends on the job. It, and it only, it only, you only wind up with that tension uh, again, where there is a viable need for interaction. Exactly. In which case, now we have to say, we in this particular situation, a fixed mindset is not suitable. Yeah. We need them to be flexible enough. Uh, now, maybe there's some things environmentally we can do where we could say, you know, we appreciate the fact that you like getting into the mode and being allowed to remain in the mode so you can do what you got to do. I can tell you personally, if you want me to edit something, uh, once I start editing, you'd best leave me alone. Yeah. Because if you pull me out of that mode, it can be a very long time before I can get back into that mode. So don't mess with me when I'm doing whatever that task happens to be. But you could then say to this person, what we do need you to do though is twice a day, we need you to be responding to questions. We need you to be interacting with others. We need you to be giving updates, et cetera. Uh, at yeah. least then we're giving them a more, um, a more realistic understanding of what their job really is right. and um, then we go it's going to go back to a matter of suitability a mm -hmm. matter of suitability um, I think another thing that I've noticed in a lot of uh, businesses particularly entrepreneurial organizations is that uh, people want to hire people that are just like them or turn everyone into someone who's just like them yeah in the DNI space team we call that the like me bias the like me bias. And what's the problem with the like me bias? Well, one of them, I'll throw this out, is that if the entrepreneur really spoke their truth, the truth is they don't want anyone just like them. That'd be a competitor. <laughs> so, you know, no, I need an army of people who will do what it is that needs to be done and do it well and not create a whole bunch of waves in the process. Not only that, T, but you can have an excellent employee who has particular characteristics and you make that the bar. Yeah. And, and it's and, and maybe it's more of a tool set skill set that's important in the job. Um, so you, you got to you got to be careful of those things. You really do. You really do. But that's why. I'm, yeah, go ahead, Tim. No, no, I'm just agreeing with David. Yeah. And that's why I just go. Well, I mean, I know I'm not saying anything you guys don't already know to be true when I say the vast majority of people that are in management and leadership positions probably have very little uh, good reason to be in that position. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, length of service. Well, are we, right. Are we still or, recording, Keith? <laughs> yeah, we're recording because it is a suitability issue. A great, great, great percentage of the people that we've encountered in management positions ended up in management positions because they needed someone to manage. And so you were handy. They put you in the job. Sales manager. Right. And that's like one of the worst things anyone it could ever of dream of doing. Do. Yeah. Because, of course, I should take my income generator and put them into a non-income generating position. That makes sense. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of them never wanted to be managers, never want, but, you know, certain circumstances arose that somebody had to step up and. Well, I know, I know one who is president of a firm who absolutely shouldn't be, but he likes it because it makes it easier for him to sell. All right, yeah. then. At least he's That's found terrible. a way to make peace with it. Yeah, right, 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 right. Terrible with people. Terrible. So, um, so, you know, if we really subjected every organization or every position in every organization to the suitability test, there'd be a lot of vacancies. <laughs> so we'd be rearranging some serious people, serious people. Um, all right, well, let's, you know, just to bring this to closure, I, um, um, I just wanted to show that there is a way that it overlays on the change grid. There is a way to use it with the change grid, primarily about identifying obstacles or uh, developing activity lists that could then reveal wherever the problems happen to be. Um, but ultimately, I think that the change grid, I don't, I hate sounding grandiose about it, but I think the change grid puts that whole mindset, skill set, tool set thing to shame. It's like it's a, it's a noble attempt, but if someone uses a change grid instead, I think you're going to get to a much more meaningful outcome much more quickly. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I know I'm biased, but what kind of bias would that be? Yeah, uh, you know, no, I'm, a, I'm biased to the truth. That's truth <laughs> bias. <laughs> you, know what would, you know what would be helpful is if you could create a couple of change grids 
that we could deploy into our own uh, client bases. Mm -hmm. Specifically regarding which one, what kind of areas, the whole, what we're talking about with mindset, skill set, tool set. Yeah. 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 I think that that could be, uh, I think having, it's so interesting, Tim, I know you're, you're rather new to our fold. So I can tell you that long, 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 long ago, maybe even longer, but as David said before the call began, he and I are about to celebrate 30 years of being associated with one another. Wow. So he's been around from the very, very beginning. In fact, 1991. David got certified sitting at my dining room table at our little house on the lake. And um, what town was it? Well, actually, yeah, Border Linden. I think we were just in Rose Township because yeah. we had a Holly. No, we had a Fenton mailing address. Yeah, I don't remember all the details. Anyway, it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. I will also tell you the material has changed very little over all these years. But <laughs> That's good to begin with. Yeah, but it used to be that we did a lot of pre-mapped activity lists. Mm -hmm. And what I found out was that new people to the change grid uh, would get rather lazy and mm -hmm. they would use these uh, these pre-mapped activity lists. And I said, no, 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 no. You got to know how to craft an activity list from scratch. Mm -hmm. And once I know you can do that, I'm more than happy to give you all the pre-mapped lists you want because they do save you some time uh, mm -hmm. or they are handy to give to a client and say, here's a starting point. So look this over and see what you want to keep and see what you want to get rid of and what you might want to modify. So they're very useful to have, but we didn't want people to use them as um, as crutches. Um, the most challenging part of the, the change grid is that activity list, creating that activity list. Mm -hmm. Everything else from that on is very straightforward. Uh, so, you need um, one of my earlier uh, jobs in my career in HR was as a compensation analyst. Mm. And in that role, um, we really dealt with activity lists. In other words, T, if you were a department head and you got budget dollars to bring on an, an additional headcount, you would contact my office and say, hey, Tim, uh, I need a, an administrative manager. Mm -hmm. And I ask you to submit to me the activity list for that job. Of course, we didn't use the term activity list. But yeah, basically, right, right, right. You know, and we would then take that and uh, we would use that to create a job description to price uh, the value of that job. Yeah. And it was all about the job, not about uh, the incumbent. Of course, at that point of the conversation, you don't have an incumbent yet. But you could, all, if, if, if David were on your team and you wanted to uh, promote him to a high level, it would be the same kind of call. Except now you're just saying, hey, I want to upgrade him. Well, I need to know what's new on the activity list. That's and, right. And so... Yeah, when I hear you talk about the, the challenge for newbies of um, creating activity lists, for me, it's it's back to that that training. Yeah, which would you know obviously help you greatly. You have no idea how many people have become involved in the world of change works, and um, and David can tell you he's he's probably encountered plenty of these people in our fold over the time period. But you mm -hmm. just kind of go, they don't even know what an activity is. Yeah. So they just wanted another tool that could just automatically be in, you know, plug and play. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not what this is really all about. This is about Well, you know, the correlation to what we talked about today and, and last week um, on that model we just reviewed is along with that, there is a component that looks at compensate, um, looks at uh, the skill set. Right. Yep, yep, yep. What are the competencies? You alluded to it earlier. What's the required knowledge, skill, and ability to do these tasks? Exactly right. Exactly right. And yeah, so sure. now, David, you've done a great deal of work in the world of recruiting as well. So right. how do you go about establishing salary ranges? Doing that sort of thing? Well, I, I will tell you that I haven't often taken on new roles. In other words, an organization that says we're hiring this for the first time. So I, I begin with the job description um, and, and the results uh, expected out of the position uh, and then back that down into competencies that are needed for the position and then measure those competencies to begin with. Yeah. And so usually it's positions that are already established with an already established um, salary range. 
Yeah, and, and you know, I don't get into too much compensation consulting. As a matter of fact, I don't do it at all because it's not an area of my expertise. Mm -hmm. So, but there are a lot of resources out there where you can get pre-established salary ranges based on industry and size of company. So, um, you know, that 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 isn't terribly difficult. But I I don't I don't make recommendations for for uh, salary ranges. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, well, Tim, I'll, uh, I'll share with you. I have a client who loves giving people grand titles, but mm -hmm. not the compensation that goes along with a grand title. Mm, that sounds like banking. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, <laughs> that's, that's the industry that we're, <laughs> we're, we're looking at. And it's like I said, you know, you got to understand that that could also greatly impact your... Um, uh, the longevity of the employee because if you're going to give me a grandiose title i get to put that grandiose title on my resume mm -hmm. and i now get to go out there and represent myself as someone who has who has worked as that grandiose title yeah. and so i'm going to go find someone who's looking for the grandiose title and will pay me accordingly <laughs> yeah yeah now uh, i'll tell you where it backfires on the employee is uh -huh. when they do get out in the market and someone like myself or David is looking yeah. at that resume and we're like, you know what? This is not VP level work. No, no. <laughs> they gave you a title. You're right. <laughs> they, gave, they gave you a plaque and some business cards. <laughs> does not give you the, you've not paid your dues. <laughs> So, there you go. Okay, uh, well, time's up for today. So um, I don't really have a topic in mind for Thursday. I'll put my thoughts together and see what I can come up with. But if you guys have anything you want to suggest, I'm more than happy to incorporate that. So just reach out to me, send me an email if you got something, and we will go from there. So, all right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. We will talk again soon. Bye for now. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.